Welcome to Back to the Basics. We're going to be talking all about failure rates today. So we're going to break where failure rate down is, um, start with the exact same definition. We're going to talk about how the standards define them, what their common use unit of measurements are, different types of failure modes and failure rates, and where you could get failure rates from, what process of a product goes through to get failure rates, how do you know if the failure rates you have are good for your application and what to do if not. And then at the end we're going to take time for any questions you may have about failure rates. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the webinar, take time and um, answer, put them into the questions tab in your GoToWebinar control panel. I'm not the best at taking questions throughout the webinar, but I'll definitely leave time at the end for anything that you may have. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I see a couple new people that I don't necessarily recognize your name from, so welcome, and if you do not know me, my name is Lauren Stewart, and I am a CFSE here at Exida. I work mostly with our mechanical customers, so a lot of the times my examples, I will be given mechanical examples. Um, but I also work with our Exeter Academy training program, so I go out and do a lot of the teaching as well. For those of you that may not be familiar with Exeter, um, we are dealing with functional safety through the complete supply chain in multiple different industry sectors. So whether you're an OEM that is actually making a product that needs to be certified, the whole way through if you're using certified products to protect your plant or your system, we have consultants, we have tools, we have training, education, we have all sorts of ways to help you be more efficient save you time and save you money. So we have the experts in functional safety, cybersecurity, and alarm management to help you out. There we go. Exida is a global um, company, I like to say no matter where you are or your customers are or the products you're buying that are certified, we have somebody close by. So if you need help with training, if you need help with functional safety, alarm management, cybersecurity, get consultants out to your plant, anything like that, we have experts close by to help you out. And we actually have opened up more offices since um, this has been updated, so we keep on expanding, which is a great thing. At Exeter, I like to say that we are a completely open book. So everything we are researching, everything we're doing, all of our process, procedures, how we're doing things, what we're interested in, we publish. We publish books, we publish white papers, we publish webinars and blogs, we go to conferences and publish research papers and give speeches. Um, we try and get the most up-to-date and relevant information in functional safety out on the market. Because if we're finding a way to make the world a safer place, we feel that we should be getting that information out to you. But enough about me and us, let's talk about why you're really here, failure rates. As I said, we're going to break the topic of failure rate down into multiple different levels. We're going to start off really, really basic on just what a failure rate is and then build upon that to hopefully when you leave the webinar, you can know if a failure rate is going to be appropriate for your application, or if it's not, what to do. So what is a failure rate? If we all start off with a clean slate and a blank definition, it will make this webinar go a lot easier. We'll know what we're talking about, right? So what is a failure rate? Well, a failure rate is a number of failures per unit time for a piece of an equipment. So we're going to be looking at an individual device and a failure rate over some time period. 
It's usually considered um, a constant value because of the bathtub curve and um, other statistics like that. Um, and it can be broken down into both safe and dangerous categories. Um, those safe and dangerous categories can also be further broken down into detected and undetected. Um, they can be looked at as independent or normal or even common cause failures. Failures are often represented by lambda, this Greek symbol in case you're not familiar with it, here big in the middle in red. And that's a unit of measurement often referred to as fits. Um, and we'll look at lambda, how it's broken down, and the unit of measurement of fits coming up. But now that we know what a failure rate is, this lambda, uh, it's number of failures per unit of time for a piece of equipment. Well, what do the standards say about failure rates? Both IEC 61508 and 511 define failure rates and say this is what a failure rate is and these are the ways you can use them. They let them be used in assessments and equations um, all throughout the standard, along with associated tables. Um, in previous versions of the standards, both IEC 61.511 and 508, it kind of just said, well, you need failure rates to use in your calculations. That's about, and they just left it at that. However, in both the new versions of the standards, the 2010 version of IEC 61508 and the 2016 of 511 really upped the language. And they said, well, yes, this is what a failure rate is and you need them for calculations. Yes, however, it needs to be more than that. Um, if you're using reliability data, when quantifying the effects of random failures, it needs to be credible, traceable, documented, and justified. Um, that's letting you know that it's not just good enough um, to just take a number and use it in your equation. You have to make sure that it is in the application it needs to be, it is credible, it is justified and documented. But this strong language really reinforces what good reliability engineers have long understood just from the beginning of reliability engineering. No matter how good your calculations are and how good your software might be that are doing those calculations, if you put failure rates that are not credible or justified in your application, they're going to be worthless. Um, my mom always said, garbage in, garbage out, no matter what you do to it, if you put non-credible, non-justified, non-traceable failure rates in, your SIL calculations will be garbage. And hopefully with this stronger language in the new standards, um, it's going to hopefully lead to the end of the use of unrealistic failure rates in SIL calculations, which is just plain dangerous, but we'll get into more of that later. So thinking to what the standard says, um, it needs to be credible, traceable, documented, and justified. I like to think of IEC 61508 and 511 as um, bridges of functional safety. So this is going to be a bridge to safety. And if you're using IEC 61511 in the right way, if you're using the functional safety life cycle, doing the right things, it's going to get you to the other side safely. However, if you pick and choose the things that you want to do, just like a bridge, um, you might not be taking out all of the main supports, but if you take out enough little ones, you're not going to be doing the same job. It's the same thing with the failure rates that we just talked about. They need to be credible, traceable, documented, justified. So if you have overly optimistic or unrealistic failure rates, um, they can really lead to unsafe designs. They can show that you might not need 
enough redundancy and you might make a one out of one system where you needed a one out of two to actually achieve the risk reduction you're calculating or you might not do proof testing as often or as complete as you need to to keep you operating in a sill blank range so both of those instances your sill could be invalid by using overly optimistic failure rates. So now let's look at how are failure rates measured. Well, failure rates are measured in often expressed, uh, let's try it again, failure rates take three. So how, off, how are failure rates measured? Well, failure rates are usually referred to as FITs. Um, and fits, depending on who you talk to, could be failures in time or failure units. And it's really the number of failures per billion hours for any piece of equipment. It's mentioned in both IEC 61508 and 511 as that kind of preferred method of unit of measurements. Um, but always be careful and double check when you are talking about failure rates and make sure it is fits because every once in a while I've seen a failure rate ex expressed in 10 to the negative 6 instead of negative 9 um, and it can get confusing. So if somebody um, talks about when you hear people talking about failure rates in general or I got this failure rate from a certificate or from an FMEDA they're generally talking in terms of fits and fits are categories that can be broken up into the safe or dangerous detected or undetected failures and they're really important pieces of information for end users. Um, the failure rights usually in FITS are what goes into a lot of the SIL verification calculations such as PFD average or PFH. Um, so it's imperative that not only that these failure rates are correct and but also for the right application, the right operation, the right demand, and that they are realistic and correct. Um, so I learn well from examples. So let's say, for example, you say I have five fits. Well, what does five fits really mean? Well, that's saying that you have five failures every 10 to the ninth hours or every per billion hours. So that's letting you know that five fits is expressed as five times 10 to the negative nine failures per hour. Next, let's talk about what are the type of failure rates and failure modes for those. So failure rate we talked about is often described of as lambda, that Greek symbol, and can be broken down. Um, if you're just talking about lambda in general, it can be a lambda for the total device, and it can be broken into safe and dangerous failures. And we will talk about these both safe and dangerous failures um, a little bit later, but the easiest way to um, know these lambdas for a device from an FMEDA or failure mode effects and diagnostic analysis report or a certificate itself. Um, so lambda S is going to represent those safe failures. Um, it can also be called a spurious failures or spurious trips. And when we're dealing in functional safety, it's usually in terms of fits. On the other hand, you have lambda D. Um, that lambda is going to be your dangerous failures per unit time for a piece of equipment. It's going to be a failure that would prevent your safety instrumented function or your SIF from performing its intended job if it needed to do so. So if a demand or a hazard was put on the system, 
the SIF cannot do the job that it intended to do. As I mentioned earlier, both the safe and the dangerous failures can be further broken up into subclasses, detectable and undetectable. So for example, Lambda D is your dangerous failure rate. It can be broken up into Lambda DD or your dangerous detected failures and Lambda DU or those dangerous undetected failures. The same thing can be said for the safe detected and safe undetected. And those failures that if it's detected or not detected is really meaning through what will your internal diagnostics find. So the diagnostics in your SIF, what are they supposed to be looking for? What will they figure out is going to happen or not? So let's um, further look into those safe or those spurious failures. So those safe failures or those lambda S's are those any failures that do not have the potential to put your safety related system in a dangerous or a fail to function safe. It's a situation where a safety related system or some component of your SIF fails to perform properly in such a way that it calls for the subsystem or system to shut down or for your safety instrumented function or SIF to activate when there is no hazard present. If you're working in the process industries, um, this is often known as a spurious trip. But what, okay, that's a great definition, but what does that really mean for you? Well, a spurious trip or a safe failure is going to be when your plant is operating in normal condition. There's no hazard, there's no demand, um, but your system still acts as if there was a problem. Your safety instrumented function, your SIF, shuts down the process even though nothing is wrong. You're operating in normal conditions, you're running normally, everything's fine, but your emergency shutdown system kicks in and takes you to your safe state. So if that's what a safe failure is, a safe detected failure is going to be represented by that lambda SD, and that's going to be the number of detected safe failures for that time period for that piece of equipment. Once again, what does that really mean? Well, those safe failures that would have spurious tripped the plant, if your internal diagnostics can figure out that you have a problem before that safe shutdown occurs, it's going to be your safe detected. On the other hand, you have safe undetected. Those would be your undetectable spurious trips or your undetectable safe failures. Those would be, once again, normally expressed in the unit of measurement of fits. Um, the safe undetected is going to be for a piece of equipment for a given time period. And it's once again going to be a failure when you're operating in normal condition, the process is normal, everything is okay, and your system acts if there's a problem and goes into the safe state. But your internal diagnostics didn't catch this problem beforehand and the shutdown actually occurs. So if we think of examples of safe failures, they, depending on what type of diagnostics you have, um, could make a certain failure safe or detected or safe undetected in different conditions. So think about if you had a loss of air pressure in an actuator that could um, make a valve close on trip in an application when you and shut down the process when you're operating normal. Or you could have an output fails open and immediately goes to a safe state. The most people kind of brush safe failures or spurious failures under the rug. But knowing your safe failure 
um, rate can really help prevent those unwanted and unneeded process shutdown, which we all know can just be frustrating, but also costly. So even though those Lambda S's and those safe failures get overshadowed by those famous Lambda D's and those dangerous failures, Safe failures are important too, so even if it's tempting to only consider your dangerous failure rate when you're taking in a system, take a moment and think of any possible safe failures you might have incur encounter as well. If you do this, you could be possibly saving time and money by not shutting down as often. Matt could be a hero. The next type of failure rates are your dangerous failures. These are those more popular, those more famous failures that everybody really talks about. Lambda D is going to be, once again, the number of dangerous failures per unit, per piece of equipment for that time period. Um, it's going to be where a time where a failure would prevent the safety instrument of function or your SIF from performing its intended job. Um, if that happens, the SIF cannot achieve safe state if needed. Just like the safe failures, your dangerous failures can be broken down into detected and undetected. Your dangerous detected failures are going to be any um, of those dangerous failures that your internal diagnostics would give you a heads up beforehand. Um, they're once again going, usually shown as fits um, and can be determined through an FMEDA. You can find these on the back of most certificates. Um, your dangerous detected failures are really going to be a dangerous failure would be a time where you have a SIF, your SIF needs to shut down the process and take you to a safe state, but it cannot do its job because of some failure. So dangerous detected would be when your internal diagnostics notice something, can alert you. Um, but one thing to know, until your SIF is fixed, it cannot achieve the safe state on its own. So if your diagnostics just alert you, you know there's an issue, um, you have to be operating and make your operators aware of the degradation of your system. On the other hand of Lambda D, you have Lambda D U. And those are your um, dangerous undetected failures. and once again, usually shown in fits and can be determined by either looking on the back of a certificate if your device is certified um, on or an FMEDA. These are the numbers that are the most famous. They're the numbers that usually go into um, your PFD average calculation. It's the number of undetected failures that could be dangerous. It is, are those failures just laying there that you have no clue are occurred or happened that if a demand happens on your system, it won't do its job, it cannot operate as function. So these are those really scariest, scary failures, the dangerous ones. Um, If you think, same thing as those safe failures, if you think of examples of dangerous failures, depending on your diagnostics, some could be dangerous, some, or some could be detected, some could be undetected, but some examples of some dangerous failures are, what if you have a um, ball valve and that ball is sheared from the stem? of the ball. Even um, depending on your diagnostics, you might know if you have movement, you might monitor the flow if you do um, testing or not, or that could be an undetected failure. You could say, oh, I'm moving the actuator. It's moving. It should be fine. 
Um, another example is a solenoid signal not alerting the actuator that it needs to energize or de-energize. Um, what about a pressure sensor not sensing high pressure? Or a valve getting stuck in the open position if it's a close on trip application? Or vice versa, that valve getting stuck closed when it needs to open? Or a transmitter shorting? Um, and a transmitter shorting, depending on the situation, it might always be undetected. Because in some cases, you might know about that transmitter shorting, but there's nothing you can do about it. So even though you know you're at a degraded state, can't do anything to help you. Once again, those dangerous failures are the famous ones, the really super important failures that go into the SIL calcs that end users do. Um, so not only knowing this number, but knowing, making sure that the number is credible, realistic, in the correct application, in the correct environment, that's absolutely key. Making sure it's realistic, just like the standard says is super important. Now, there are other failures as, as well as those safe and danger dangerous that aren't as popular, but this is for a reason. They're good pieces of information to know, but they're not going to directly impact your safety system's ability to do its job. Some of these examples are Lambda A for enunciated failures, Lambda and E for no effect failures, and Lambda E for external leaks. Um, enunciated failures, let's first look at those, are failures that really, once again, have no effect on your safety function, but it does affect the ability to detect future failures. So what does that mean? Remember those internal diagnostics that make something detected or undetected? This is a failure in those diagnostics or that system. So even though your SIF is going to still work and still do a demand correctly if a hazard occurs, you will not know in the future if a detected failure arises. So all of those dangerous detected and safe detected failures would then become dangerous undetected and safe undetected failures. Um, some examples of an enunciated failure could be your display is not showing up correctly or your internal diagnostics just not working. Just like safe and detected enunciated failures can be further broken up into subclasses of detected or undetectable if diagnostics are looking for those direct failures. The next failure rate we want to look at, um, let's look at NE or no effect failures. Um, they can also, sometimes they are referred to as residual failures as well. Um, but those are failures that once again have no direct um, consequence on your safety function. So your safety system, it can still do its job. These, just like the enunciated failures, are often expressed in unit of measurements of fits and all the enunciated no effect and external leaks, they can all be given to you through FAMITAs. Um, no effect failures are, or residual failures are failures which occur in normal operation and if the valve still needs to close, the valve can still close. If it needs to open, it can still open. It doesn't matter. Um, but maybe if you have something like a hazardous process, they would be good to know. Some no effects failures could be like external leaks, possible internal leaks, maybe display issues, um, bolts loosening, mounting loosening, things like that. Even paint scratching. Um, just like other failure categories, no effect failures can be further broken up into subclasses, but these aren't detected in undetected categories like the others. Because if they don't affect your safety system, why build a diagnostic looking for it? So you're not going to have any um, detected no effect failures. However, 
no effect failures can be classified, clarified into um, no or external leaks. And this will be extremely relevant if you have hazardous process, something that could really do some damage if it is leaked out in, in contact with people or the environment. These other failure rates, um, most of the time, they're not going to be on the back of the certificate. There's just so much information you can cram onto a little area. However, these failures um, will all show up in a FAMIDA report. So if it'll list all the relevant failures, including any no effect failures. So if you need to know more information, you want to norm it, no more information, go back to the manufacturers and ask for the FAMIDA reports and ask for the other failures. There's so many times when we just have people only care about that dangerous undetected failure rate and we try to let them know that there are many other things to be aware of, but a lot of people just want one number and done. So where do failure rates come from? Um, there are two fundamental ways to get failure rates. You can estimate them or predict them. Um, the estimation technique comes from um, estimating failures based on field failure data and using statistical analysis. Um, but to do that, you have to have a good understanding of equipment operation, component failure modes, the environment, the operation, the application, the equipment used, how the data is going to be used, um, and have a high confidence. And the standard says high as more than 90% confident in that failure um, rate. The other way, um, sorry, let me give you some examples of estimation techniques. Um, this is going to be field failure um, reports or information from manufacturers data. This could be field um, failure information from end users. This could be database studies, something like ARETA. Um, the great thing about the estimation technique is it is based on real and historical data. However, um, if you're using a large database, you don't have specific information per device or um, per application. And if you are an end user or a manufacturer using field failure reports, you might not have enough of this information available to make statistical analysis sense. If you have a low um, number of failures, just having one failure is really going to skew results, majorly alternating, altering things. And another problem is with estimation techniques, a lot of the times, by the time the data is collected, analyzed, statistically gone through, you have your failure rate. If it's an electrical part, things get out of date, especially with software, um, so quickly. And also, if you have a new product, you don't have the historical data. So a second approach to getting failure rate data came along, and that is prediction. That is predicting a failure rate based on either test results or design stress strength analysis. Um, for low demand mode of operation, we generally talk about FAMIDAs. For high demand, we can talk about um, FAMIDAs or more test-based results. But for this webinar, I'm going to concentrate on process industry and low demand. So I'm going to um, only talk about FAMIDA and the design stress strength analysis of failure mode effect and diagnostic analysis FAMIDA. It is a detailed approach of every failure mode of every component in a given design. Um, it is a stress level for a specific design of a specific application and specific environment. So when a FAMIDA is done, we get down to the manufacturer make series model, that type of information, along with what type of applications it could be used for, if it's clean service, if it's severe service, if we are supposed to use it in climate controlled cabinet mounted um, 
indoor lovely facilities or if it can be thrown under the sea without any problems. Um, FMEDA was started with a FME appro FMEA approach, adding in the diagnostic um, and the diagnostic capabilities. When the FMEDA is done, we look at the drawing and the bill of materials in every way we can possibly break it and use the component database to put together a product failure rate, a product failure mode, diagnostic coverage, even useful life. Um, because the FAMIDA is both application specific and environmental specific, it means we can consider how the device works and is set up exactly how it will be operating. We do this because just like the safe and dangerous, we are detected and undetected failures we talked about um, before, different failure modes can be dangerous in one FAMIDA application or safe in another FAMIDA application. For example, a ball valve can be operated in both open to trip or close on trip application where a failure might be dangerous in one and safe in the other. Along with the application, the operation, if it's severe service or clean, we look at six different environmental profiles going everywhere from climate controlled the whole way to offshore, subsea, and process wetted with severe service and anything in between. So now I know what if product goes through to get their failure rate, but how do I get a product failure rate? Well, if you're using certified products, that's really easy. You can go on the SAEL website, pull up any of the certificates, go on the back of the certificate. It's going to give you all of your failure rates. As you can see here, I didn't zoom in, but we have it broken up into safe detected, safe undetected, dangerous detected, and undetect dangerous undetected failure rates per each different application, close on trip, open on trip, tight shut off. We have it for clean service, severe service, with partial valve stroke testing, without all of the different ap applications this particular device is good for. Um, you can also ask the manufacturer for an FMEDA report. If it is not certified, once again, go back to that manufacturer, ask them for the FAMIDA report or their failure rates. But if they give them to you, always check to make sure, ask them how were these failure rates achieved? Was it done per an evaluation for low demand mode operation like a FAMIDA or was it done for looking at high demand mode of operation like cycle testing. Make sure it is um, good for the same environment. Once again, if you are um, operating in below the North Sea, don't take failure rates from an analysis for a cabinet mounted or climate controlled device. Um, make sure that you are going to compare apples to apples. Remember what these failure rates are going into safety calculations. So how do you know if your failure rate is appropriate for your application or not? What I always tell my customers is first things first, go to sillsafedata.com. Um, I call this my reality check. It has a lot of different products and just so you know, it is uh, relatively new. So it is adding new and more and more products. So if you're seeing something that you need more information on, email them. They can keep adding more. But this will give you kind of a lower bounds and an upper bounds on where to be for pretty generic type devices. So we're not going to say this exact manufacturer, this make, this model will be this. No, go to the certificates for that. If you say, I am looking at a floating ball valve, it should be about this. Still safe data is exactly where you go. So let's zoom in. Um, for example, 
we can look at an actuator. We can say we have a pneumatic scotch yoke actuator. Um, there's two different types, double acting or spring return. You should fall, your dangerous failure rate should fall somewhere in between 500 fits and 1600 fits for double acting. So if you have a double acting pneumatic scotch yoke actuator and you were given a failure rate of 17.3 fits, you can kind of raise your red flag and say, wait, how did you get this information? And this one was actually um, given, and this was just per the manufacturer's return data. They just looked at how many things they got back um, compared to the number they sent out and gave that as their failure rate. Definitely a lot of missing information there. But once again, cell safe data let them know that this was not in the appropriate range. You can see a typical range. Um, well, this was a spring return, so between 400 and 1,200 fits. And they looked up the uh, FAMITA and saw that a FAMITA was actually at 600 fits, so that fell in between. So if you're a little bit under or a little bit over, that might not be a big deal, but if you're an order of magnitude better, that's when you sit there and ask questions. I'm a very visual person, so I like to see what um, this looks like visually. I plotted a lot of different, this was solenoids, Thamita's um, ARETA data um, from the offshore reliability of the North Sea database, um, pipeline database, Dow de chemical databases, um, along with the SIL safe data limits. There's different types of solenoid valves and different complexities, so different limits. But notice that there's also some um, failure rates that were way low. Doing more research, we found out, once again, it was either done by analyzing high demand mode of operation and using it in low demand, or just using return numbers alone. So go back with sales safe data, do your sanity check, make sure that you're in a reality zone um, when before you use them in calculations. So what happens if you've done your evaluation, you went on sales safe data, and you realize you're not realistic. You don't have what you need, but you still want to do your calculations correctly. What do you do then? Well, if you do not have generics, well, first of all, if you have generic numbers, um, use those. However, if you do not, um, you can use the high bounds of SillSafeData.com. Um, however, these numbers will be very conservative. Um, they tend to be higher than certified devices. But this is because if the device is not certified or you don't know the application, you don't have all sorts of people pieces of information, you don't know if their how their quality management system has been analyzed, you don't know the protection against failures they have built in, things like that, um, that can be prevented, so you expect them to be higher. Sales safe data was brought around by comparing billions and billions, hundreds of billions of unit operating hours together um, from different industry sectors, um, oil and gas, offshore, chemical, power, um, and making a higher and lower bounds. Um, this is just an example for motor controllers. I had a customer that said, we have no information on motor controllers. What do we do? Well, you can always use that higher representation as a limit. We've often been asked, well, can we just use an average between the lower and the upper? You know, as a functional safety engineer, I cannot uh, sleep at night with telling you yes um, with that. I tell all of my customers I design um, safety systems and do calculations as if someone I loved were going to be working at the plant right there. Um, if you don't have the information of the specific device, you don't know how it compares to others with complexity, how the manufacturer's quality management, all of that information, you don't control. So you have to use a more conservative number when doing your calculations. 
So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and take a break for questions. If you really liked this and want more information and want more functional safety in your life, we have training. Um, and if you want to do it online, we now are doing, oops, there it was, self paced online training if you want to um, do it at home instead of being live and um, all of that. And if you want more information, feel free to reach out to us at any point. Um, we actually don't have any questions this afternoon. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. And come and see more of Exodus webinars. Thank you.